I feel that on the way down, we kind of meet at somewhere that's sort of like a cosmic bus stop where we meet other souls that are also uh, coming with their own path and purpose. And we might be sitting around in that cosmic bus stop and sharing, oh, what are you going for? Ah, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down this time because I need to master forgiveness, for example. That's, I, I've come so many times and it keeps tripping me up and I'm just, I want to nail it this time. I'm going to nail forgiveness. And then another soul says, so what would it take for you then to nail forgiveness? And, and you'd be like, oh, something pretty awful. You know, maybe it would be that a drunk driver killed my family something like that and then some poor old soul in the corner puts their hand up and goes I'll do it I'll do it and everyone looks and they're like you'll do it why would you say that why are you making why are you saying that you'll be the person that kills the family and that person says well because Hey everyone and welcome back to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jumi Moses. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Gemma. Gemma is a modern medicine woman, retreat leader, healer, and ceremonialist. And she offers deep transformational work globally. She's currently in Peru. So thank you so much, Gemma, for joining Shifting Dimensions. Oh, Jimmy, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute honor and a delight to be here and to be joining you from these beautiful mountains down here in the Sacred Valley in Peru. Yes. And, you know, before we started recording, we talked briefly about the fact that you had just ended a 20 day pilgrimage. And I'm really interested to learn more about what is a pilgrimage? I'm going to start there, you know, layman terms. What is a pilgrimage and what did that 20 day pilgrimage or journey entail? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually. What is a pilgrimage? Because it is different. It's different to go on pilgrimage to to just go on a retreat. And um, I, I've been bringing people here to the Andes since 2013. So it's over 10 years now. And um, uh, it's changed, I guess, in the way that I facilitate because, you know, you refine and you understand really what people need. Um, because there's so many different aspects, I think, for us as we move through our modern day lives and as we're really understanding more about um, who we really want to be and and who we really are beyond all of the conditionings and the limitations and the programs that we've kind of been laid with and, and carried throughout all of our lives. And that the pilgrimage is a part of that. It's really removing yourself from your everyday environment to get you into um, uh, an environment that's supportive of this deep work that you can do for yourself and with this i combine um, so the first part of our journey is some preparation practices so we receive it's really amazing i actually have uh, one of my elders coming down from a place called keros which is a high 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 mountain communities about six and a half thousand meters above sea level. This place is phenomenal in that it was um, never infiltrated by the conquistadors back in the colon colonial times. So the traditions that come from there are still held in, in, in purity. It's very, very beautiful. So he comes down and we do a thing called a carpe, which is an initiation. So we begin by um, making an offering to Pachamama. We call that a despacho or a hayawikri is the traditional name. And it's an offering of all kinds of things flowers seeds coca leaves and it's done for each specific person for their own specific path so it's the path that they're walking whilst they're here in the andes and we're going through this pilgrimage but what they're receiving here whether they're new to this kind of thing which a lot of people are completely new and have never been here before or whether you know they're people that are already kind of on a spiritual path of some kind it opens the way for them so that it makes their path um, more easeful, more abundant, more joyful. And ultimately, as we're receiving, you know, the more we fill our cups up, like a medicine cup, the more uh, we're able to give effortlessly. So in the receiving, we're able to be an even greater service. So that's kind of the intention as we begin. And then from there, we receive this initiation under a waterfall under a sacred waterfall, where it's fantastic to watch. It's awesome, because it's it's done with um 
big, huge, big bunches of traditional medicinal herbs that clear the energy, that heal the physical body, um, that uh, kind of re-imprint any um, of the heavier energies with high frequencies of light. So it brings in a lot of vitality and a lot of cleansing and purification. And they literally get bashed. <laughs> with those herbs <laughs> under the waterfall and it's a fantastic uh ritual with a lot of prayer um by the elders and that prepares us for our path we work with breath work um to to open us uh to the next stage of our work which is then to start moving into the temples and the sacred sites and working with the sacred medicines of the andes here so we spend about uh, of the 15 days, we spend about nine days um, in sacred sites, mountains and temples. And then the beginning and the end is like a preparation period. And then there's an integration period. So we have lots of really delicious, yummy stuff in there as well to help um, really recalibrate the central nervous system and help people to really pull all of their experiences so that when they leave, they're not sort of feeling like they've been blasted open and like, whoa, what next? but rather um, everything's brought back to center. They're feeling really resilient, really grounded, really clear, really strong and really joyful to go back out and spread the magic into the into their communities around the world. But the, the part of the journey where we're traveling and moving a lot into the temples and the sacred sites is really a journey of remembering. Um, you know, for me, having done this work for a lot of years and had a, a lot of my own uh, experiences in these places, I 100% these places have been coded. They're coded with wisdom, with frequency, with information for remembering. Who were they coded by? The ancient masters, you know, the enlightened ones that knew all the way back then through the prophecies that there would be a time where we would return and it would be a time where there was a changing of the cycles. We call it a pachakutek. It's like a, 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 yeah, a cyclic period and we're moving into a whole new cycle now. And they knew back then that we would need support to um, really return to the original program, to our original essence. And for me, I feel like um, as we were as it might sound, um, I, I don't think that all of our strands of DNA are activated. I think there's a dormant, a dormant strand of DNA there that is waking up, that holds the original blueprint. And these masters knew that, they coded these places. So when, when we take people into these places, there's a, a deep, deep, deep uh, remembering that takes place and it's absolutely majestic to witness. So that's the pilgrimage. I think the difference between a pilgrimage and a retreat is that you're going with a very specific purpose. It's not only about just sort of scratching at the surface and seeing what's there. It's an inner journey into our inner world. And at the same time, it's the remembering of um, who we really are and why we came and receiving the tools, the wisdom and the information uh, um, and how we can, um, you know, be here on this beautiful planet um, in service to the awakening of the planet and to our brothers and sisters so that we can kind of reach that tipping point that I think we're all going towards uh, that will bring us into that, um, I might be going a bit ahead of myself, but into that frequency of the fifth dimension, which is the frequency of the heart, you know, rather than the old paradigm of the mind, that's really what we're all headed towards. So for me, as many people as we can kind of um, wake up and, and um, get moving towards that tipping point, then there will be eventually a knock-on effect, and I think we'll find ourselves living on a very different planet, possibly in this lifetime, let's see. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people have been talking about this shift to a new earth. Thank you so much for explaining that. So to make sure I fully understand, right, it seems like this pilgrimage, it, it encompasses a lot of things. One of the biggest themes is kind of, I guess, the person on it is giving themselves permission to go through this spiritually transformational journey, right? And everyone on that pilgrimage has a specific journey that they're on, though people are on the journey together, they're experiencing things differently. And through the initiations that you talked about with them giving offerings, it's more of kind of like, I guess, maybe offerings towards what they want to experience or learn or release potentially. Um, Cause I know that word initiation is used a lot. And I just want to make sure the viewers fully understand that initiations are kind of the best way I can describe it almost is like when you go to school and 
it's time for you to graduate. Like, yes, you can go to school. You don't have to go to a ceremony, but a lot of people go to their graduation ceremony. They receive their diploma. I don't know if that's a great analogy, but to me, that's kind of how I think about like initiations, like you're initiating into the next step of some sort of journey um, and you're being intentional with that journey. So the initiation is kind of like marking the step towards that new chapter or that new experience. Um, and I like how you described the importance of the sacred sites, because I was going to ask, like, what makes Peru so important? And I hear a lot of spiritual leaders go to Peru and go to these ancient sites. And it's interesting that you said that these sites are coded. There's so much energy that's potent. So I guess people who step into these ancient sites are picking up on those frequencies, right? Which is again, elevating their frequency and waking people up more. So I just wanted to sum that up. Let me know if I'm missing anything. That's amazing. I love the way you summed that up. Yeah, you're bang on. It's, um, it's, and it's so beautiful to be brought back around to to that perspective of, of things as well, because you're exactly right. And yeah, the initiation process, um, I feel my partner actually works, the work that he does is in rites of passage. So he is all about um, these kind of missed initiations that so many of us have, because back in um, ancient times, I mean, there's some indigenous cultures that still do it, but right across the world, you know, when uh, we reached a certain age, there was an initiation or a rite of passage to mark the moving from one way of being into the next, from closing one cycle and moving into the next and being celebrated as well. I think that for me, that's a massive part of the initiation process is the celebration. We can't complete that cycle until we celebrate it and then we're honored for where we've been and where we've come. And then we, we level up and we step into the new cycle. So um, yes, exactly. That was a beautiful metaphor that you used, you know, um, with, when you're graduating school and you know we create initiations for ourselves either consciously or unconsciously i think throughout our lives and the 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 beautiful thing about um curating a very specific rite of passage or an initiation is that we go into it consciously and so we're very aware of what it is that no longer serves us what it is we're ready to put down what it is we're ready to move past you know we still might be working with it but we set a very very clear um, intention even beyond an intention a program it's like writing the code of a program for ourselves that this is how it was and I honor, acknowledge, and you go through the process of um, liberating that. And now this is what I'm stepping into and deciding um, that you're going to take that next step. And that really is what we're creating. So, yeah, it's a very, very beautiful analogy. Thank you. Of you course, mean? of course. Um, you know, something else that you just recent you just mentioned now where you talked about kind of remembering who we are, right? Um I want to talk about that because I hear people say that all the time, like we need to remember who we are or, you know, spirit beings having a human experience. There's a great shift coming. And I want to know from your perspective, your understandings in, in the journey that you've been on and, and the work, work that you do, who are we? Right. Mm -hmm. And and why is it important for us to remember at this time? It's a really, really another awesome question because that is thrown around um, a lot out there. And I'm, I'm sure some people are like, what does that actually even mean? I mean, it, and ultimately it's going to mean something different probably for everybody. It's going to mean what it means for you. Um, the, 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 the simplicity of it before I break it down, um, if you just close your eyes for a moment, right? Close your eyes for a moment. And if you can imagine, like when we go into these sacred sites, we see a lot of carvings and monoliths and pictures of these, um, these beings that often look like these intergalactic beings. And around them are all of these kind of beautiful squiggles and patterns. And as you're looking at these squiggles and patterns, you may at first be wondering, what is that? And you start to realize that they are filaments of light each one of those squiggles and those patterns carry codes of divinity they are codes from the cosmos they are codes of remembering and they are pure in their nature they are 
absolute light. If you can imagine the light of a thousand suns and beyond, blazing and brilliant, and maybe that sunlight, that golden light, even becomes very celestial. It starts to become like this kind of diamond light. And in this true nature, which is an aspect of this one whole or this one source, each little fragment, each little being, that piece of you, that essence that came from that original source, knows that it has nothing to do, it has nothing to fix, it has nothing to heal, it's simply here in the service of light. It's simply here to be here on this beautiful planet to anchor those celestial divine frequencies of love for the nourishment of this planet and for the upliftment of every being that's here. And there's a part of this uh, true self, there's a part of this divine self, and part of that self is called the soul. So maybe within that celestial light, you can see that there's a character there and this beautiful character that's there, this soul is the one that has moved through all the different lifetimes right from the beginning of time. And its, its journey was so that this celestial, this divine uh, truth of who we are can experience itself in this human form. It wants to be able to be made manifest on the planet because without the physical body, it can't ever actually have a direct experience of what it is to be on the earth. And so this beautiful soul, as it moves through all of its past lifetimes and all of the different travels that it does through the dimensions, collecting all of these experiences, its purpose is always to find itself back to remembering that it's this celestial divine essence. And temporarily, it kind of separates itself so that it can go on this journey of remembering. And that's the part of us that manifests into this physical body lifetime and lifetime, time and time again, and records and remembers everything that we've ever been through. It's the part of us that thinks it has something to come here to do or something that, come, that, that it's come here to learn. But eventually, that part of ourselves realizes that it was all an experience. And eventually we return to that divinity, that truth of who we are, that can't be touched, that can't be uh, thrown off our center, that doesn't judge, that doesn't criticize, that doesn't hate, that just is. And eventually when we realize this, when we're in our human body and we have the realization of this uh, true nature, of this true divinity, then we just radiate we simply shine and simply by another just being in our presence without us having to do anything, something magical happens. And that being, that person begins this process of remembering also. And eventually over time, who knows whether it's our lifetime or it's another, we get to a state where all of these physical vehicles on the planet have had this remembering of this divinity. Maybe there's not even a need for language anymore. Maybe it's just that to communicate, we put our hand on each other's heart, we look into each other's eyes and we know exactly what we need to communicate. That the earth is in harmony, that everything is restored to its perfect balance and its true nature. Everything is in, in complete harmony on the planet and the planet in this as well as she's gone through all of her cycles of remembering too she also blossoms into her fullness and this planet returns to what it was always meant to be which is a planet of paradise and of peace where everything uh, is there's not even a need for equality because everything is one so this is a visceral feeling of what we're all moving towards, what we're all remembering. And we need to have compassion for that part of ourselves, for that beautiful soul that, uh, you know, then inhabits this body with a mind, which kind of impacts 
the whole thing, but all of that and all of the experiences that we choose, including the really tough ones, the traumas are all to bring us eventually back to knowing that we are these seeds of light, these seeds of love. And our purpose here on this earth is simply to be the best seed that we can be, to awaken so that at the end of our lives, when we're planted back into Pachamama, thousands more like us can come. And that's our legacy. You can just take Beautiful. a nice deep breath. And that's it. Sometimes, wow. it's easy. Sometimes it's easier to speak with feeling. Yeah, no, thank you so much for just breaking that down. I had my eyes closed the whole time as well. And again, it kind of reminds me of this thing people keep talking about, which is this heaven on earth, right? And I, I've seen that sort of prophecy, I should say, quote unquote, in religious texts. I've seen people talk about it um, in the spiritual community as well. And people have different takes on it, but I think there's something that we're all picking up on, right? We're picking up on this shift and we're all moving towards that shift. What you talked about, just a return to being, a return to balance, a return to love, a return to peace um, and, and paradise really. And it's interesting that these conversations are being had at a time where it seems like there's so much chaos and unrest in different parts of the world. So that juxtaposition is very interesting, but I think when those things happen, it just shines a light more on the urgency of why we need to continue to have these conversations and and do the work that we're doing, especially, you know, like you, you said, like through the pilgrimages and just us waking up to ourselves, right? Because I don't even think we need to go on a pilgrimage necessarily to tune into our divine energy. And I would even argue that a lot of times we know who we are when we're children, and then we're programmed to forget all of that. And there's something you talk about, which is the ego versus the essence. Mm. And it kind of seems like what you were describing is a release of the ego, a release of the societal programming and a stepping into our essence, which is that spirit side of us, which is that intergalactic, interdimensional part of who we are mm. um, and just kind of stepping more into that space and releasing the parts of us that no longer serve us, especially since they've been, we were programmed. Right. So I can, I'll stop there and let you answer or, or add to what I just said. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. There's so much there that I could speak into. Um, what I would say is after we just did that little guided process, that meditation, when we come out of those things, um, is to practice staying in the feeling so that when we're then sharing and talking, we still have the awareness, you know, because we can go into these altered states and then we're snapped back into reality and it's like, oh, now I'm here in the 3D. And that's so moving into that 5D consciousness, which, you know, some people might think, oh, what is that? Does that mean that it's in another is that is it somewhere else is the earth going to split in two and then there's a there and there's a here and of course it's right here right now it's it's a way of being that we're stepping into um and the practice of of of, of staying in that frequency whilst we're having the 3d interactions i think is how we kind of retrain ourselves it's not always easy it takes a lot of you know as we know the uh the the conscious mind is only in charge 10 percent of the time so we've really got to rein it in and and you know um it's kind of like the groove on the record you know the needle will keep playing that groove it's going to keep playing that song until we have the the discipline to cut a new groove so that's what we're practicing but in terms of the remembering for me what i really really feel um is that we have before we come before we come here now bearing in mind and it was actually my dad's passing that taught me this about the three it's not something that i read or that someone told me but it was a very visceral lesson embodied understanding of these these three parts that we are we have this physical you know this avatar i think it really is like the avatar 
movie in reverse so rather than being the blue being that the human plugs into it's the human spacesuit that you chose to have this adventure in and the blue being or the star being is the one that's plugging into that and moving through life so that straight away gives it a whole different perspective because you're like oh hang on a second like this is a simulation i'm stepping into a simulation here and actually right now the simulation is breaking down like we're seeing that i just digressing for a moment i had a moment a very funny moment in but for me, it was it was funny. For someone else, it might be quite disturbing. Where I was doing a Pilates class, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I could no longer see my body. Or I could see all I could see was a man, a completely different form, a completely different look to me, whatsoever. And I was like, "Whoa, what is that?" And I heard the simulation is breaking down. You know that this physical that you think you are is—is is it really who you are? What have you chosen? You can change it at any minute. You know, and then all of a sudden it starts to make sense about all of the, you know, with all the gender neutral stuff that goes on at the moment and stuff. I'm like, of course, if, if people are like, I want to change my avatar, they're going to change their avatar. You know, it's that—it's it, kind of that simple. Like when you break it down. So we have this human spacesuit, the body that we inhabit. And then we have this essence, this part of us that we just tapped into then that does not change. Like you might even, I know I do, sometimes I think back to when I was a little girl, like six or four, and the one that was looking out through those eyes back then is the same one that's looking out now. Nothing's changed with that one. The, the, the sense, you know, in those moments, I remember when I was a kid and I, I was an only child, so I would spend a lot of time daydreaming and being in nature and playing with animals and all the things and that essence that was present in those moments is exactly the same essence that's present now when i'm in the mountains rolling down at sunset picking up stones there's no difference you know this is the essence that doesn't change it's the isness and then there's this part of us the ego or the even the soul that is like this record keeper that is the one that's moving and traversing through lifetimes through experiences and that's the part of us that before we came uh i feel like it's interesting because for me from again from when i was a kid i used to, in, in the hot summer nights we used to sleep outside because we didn't have air conditioning and in australia and i'd lie out there with my mum and dad and i'd point to the pleiades and i'd say home home and my mum would say oh that's the seven sisters and i'd be like home like this and she reminds me of it all the time and then i you know i come here and i've been working here in the andes for um 12 years now and uh here it's not woo woo at all if you ask somebody where they're from they'll say well, we're from the pleiades or if you're up in bolivia we're from orion like they don't have that same sense of being they they're very connected to the earth but they know they're here in service to the earth right so and it's not woo woo it's just natural for people to know that so for me and my understanding and what i've been shown for myself is that before we came we uh, decide the soul decides you know what is it that i need to complete this time around what is it i want to experience what is it that i want to learn it's kind of like going to peru on pilgrimage except rather than going for two weeks or 20 days you're going for i don't know 80 100 years if you if you might be lucky you know and i think for me when things get curly down here i look at it that way because i'm like i chose to come on this adventure like i'm on holiday and if i went to I'm just about to take off myself uh, day after tomorrow on a crazy spontaneous adventure to the temples of Shavin, which is the birthplace, the origin of the medicine that I work with. And who knows? I mean, like I'm going to get no sleep for three days. I'm going to sit on a bus. I'm going to go. And even though I don't function well on no sleep, I do not like, I, I don't like buses, but I'm going to do it because it's an adventure, right? So even though it might feel tough, I'm still, I'm going to love it because it, I know that it's exciting and it's, it's, you know, facilitating some change and growth within me. So it's to remember that, that that's we, you know, and I joke all the time because I'm like, when something uh, gnarly goes on, I'm like, that wasn't on the brochure. Like what I saw was chocolate, waterfalls. <laughs> that was, that was the brochure they showed me up there and said, you should go down to earth it's pretty good down there you know so it's that part of us that wants to come and experience those things meanwhile the essence the true self is sitting back like 
I always see it like a beautiful grandfather or a grandmother in a rocking chair that's just like, off you go, sweetheart, go and have your adventure. I'm just going to stay here until you realize that there's, there's no, nowhere better than here. There's nothing else to do there's, you know, and wait for you to come home. So that's, that's how I experience it. And I've, I feel that on the way down, we kind of meet at somewhere that's sort of like a cosmic bus stop where we meet other souls that are also uh, coming with their own path and purpose. And we might be sitting around in that cosmic bus stop and sharing, oh, what are you going for? Ah, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down this time because I need to master forgiveness, for example. That's, I, I've come so many times and it keeps tripping me up and I'm just, I want to nail it this time. I'm going to nail forgiveness. And then another soul says, so what would it take for you then to nail forgiveness? And, and you'd be like, oh, something pretty awful. You know, maybe it would be that a drunk driver killed my family, something like that. And then some poor old soul in the corner puts their hand up and goes, I'll do it, I'll do it. And everyone looks and they're like, you'll do it? Why would you say that? Why are you making, why are you saying that you'll be the person that kills the family? And that person says, well, because my path and what I feel I need to do is to master forgiveness of self. And I know that if that's the path that I play out, people are going to hate me. And so the only option that I have to liberate myself is to forgive myself. And boom, in that moment, a contract is made. That's a sacred contract, right? So this is where we, it's kind of a little bit, you know, it's like, why would I choose my traumas? Well, we choose them because in our infinite wisdom, we know that that's what we need to experience to overcome. And we also know that we're going to get to a point in our lives where we remember that we chose. So we remember that we can now choose differently. And that's when we become the masters of our reality. So why do we forget? So we come down, we come through the cosmos, you know, here in the Andes, they say that we're carried on the wings of the crystal condor. We come down, we come through the birth canal and we experience our first trauma. So going through, I mean, how dramatic you want to be, that process of being squeezed through, you know, you've been hanging out in there in the physical body, you're floating around in the amniotic fluid, everything's good, but you already are starting to take on in that moment, you're starting to take on the processes of what? Of the parents what your mum's going through, what your dad's going through, her emotions, their relationship from the outside, you know, by, by the third tri trimester, you're starting to pick up on all of that stuff, right? And then, but you still, I believe at that point, you still know who you are and you know why you've come. And then you go through that process of being born and you come out and what happens? Bright lights, all of a sudden breathing air, strange faces, weird noises. Somebody comes at you and cuts your lifeline off that's been keeping you alive for the last nine months. Or there's a traumatic birth where there has to be a Caesar or something like that. And what happens? Splat. And the energy disperses. And in that moment when the energy disperses, you forget who you are. That's the forgetting in that moment. And there are some beings, and I think there's more and more of them coming through, that don't forget. But this is how, you know, like the Dalai Lama is initiated, for example, isn't it? Because he remembers. Like at three or four, he's going to certain artifacts and saying, this was my toy in the last life, or this was, you know, so he doesn't have that forgetting. But for most of us, um, up until this point, that we do, we forget. And so our true nature being love is that we want naturally like a compass we're going to orientate ourselves back to the frequency of love so that means that we start to pretzel ourselves into good girl good boy you know to receive the love and the acceptance from the people around us our family first and foremost and then our community but also in that moment because we've forgotten who we are we instantly we start this process of trying to remember and in that trying to remember we start to pick up um, the beliefs the conditions the programs the patterns the all of the things from all of the people around us and we start to build uh, a false identity so it's not who we are it's who they are and guess what it wasn't who they are either because they also forgot 
and so did the ones before them, and so did the ones before them. So it's this whole collection of thoughts, ideas, beliefs, and programs. And we have to have a program, right? Because, you know, if you buy a computer and you don't put a program into it, the computer doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. It's just a blank screen. So it has to have an operating system of some kind. It's just that the operating system we've been running may not serve us and doesn't belong to us. It actually isn't ours. The other thing that happens in that moment, which is really interesting, is before we've forgotten who we are, our true nature is crystalline, like that being that we just tapped into, tuned into, and even physically, as you'd know, like the stuff that we're made up of is the composition of a crystal or of stardust, right? So what does a crystal do? A crystal doesn't say no to heavy energy and yes to good energy. It doesn't say I need to protect myself. It, the crystal is just like it knows who it is. So it's like bring it on. Whatever it is, whether it's heavy, whether it's light, whether it's good, whether it's bad, I don't judge. I'm going to take that. I'm going to transform it into the highest frequencies of light and then I'm going to send it out as blessings. You know, that's what a crystal does. It transforms energy, right? Crystals don't need cleaning, even though people say they do. When a crystal has had enough and it's done enough of its work, it'll break. Crystals are natural transformers. They're, high, they're, they're the highest, highest frequency and they all have their different properties, but that's what they do. And that's who we are. But we also forget that in that splat. So in that moment, as soon as we take our first breath in, we become unconscious. And in that moment, when we are no longer conscious of what kind of energy we are taking in, are we taking in heavy energy? We call it hucha in the Andes, or are we taking in light, which is sami, which is the high frequency energy, right? So in that moment that we forget and that first breath in, as we come out of the womb, because the, the last breath is a breath out, right? That's what we give, but the first breath is what we receive. So we take that first breath in and straight away we take on the processes of all of the people in that room, especially the processes of our parents, of our families and our communities. And humans have this uncanny thing that we do like Gollum with its ring where we're like, mine. <laughs> I don't mind my precious, it's mine. So we take that energy, right? And if it's a heavy energy, we don't know what it is, where it's come from, and we're empathic because we're all empaths that are being born now and highly sensitive beings. We have to be because that's how the earth's going to change because if we're not, you know, an empath isn't going to hurt somebody else because they feel it. So nature and the universe and the cosmos has taken care of it and made sure that pretty much everyone coming through now is highly empathic and highly sensitive, which is why people are having such a hard time as well because they haven't learned to turn their sensitivity into a superpower yet. But, you know, there's there's ways uh, of learning how to remembering how to do that, not learning, but remembering. So in that unconsciousness, we take that heavy energy on. We don't know who it belongs to as we go through life. We're still in every breath that we take in, taking on that heavy energy. We don't know who it comes from or why we just are taking it in. And then we start to match it to something that's happened in our lives and we were it around in our being and we make it ours and we fuel the stories of whatever has happened in our life. We make them even heavier than they ever were in the first place and they weren't even ours in the first place. And then as we breathe out, that's what we give. So we, we can unconscious, we're not conscious of what we're receiving and what we're giving, we can be perpetuating a cycle of suffering. We can be perpetuating a cycle of heavy energy instead of high frequency energy. So as we go through life and we start to make this journey of remembering and there's a point where you're like, hang on a second, I don't think I believe that about myself. Where did that belief even come from in the first place? You know, like, uh, my nana, bless her soul, she's passed now, bless her heart. I mean, she was a hard lady. She had a very hard life growing up. But she always used to say to me, oh, she hasn't she got good heavy legs? She's got good heavy legs, right? And for her, she probably thought that was a good thing. For me, I'm like, oh, my God, I look like a tree trunk. You know, so for years I didn't wear any skirt above my knee because I, you know, so that was a, a, a like on the purely on the physical level, but that's just a tiny example of how these things are layered. And then there's a point where you're like, hang on a second, where did that even come from? Like all of these programs and conditionings and then 
we start to unpick it, don't we? We, you know, start to unravel and peel back the layers of the onion and start to discover, hopefully at first, probably with some projection. <laughs> at first, we're probably like, it was their fault. And then you start to realize, ah, hang on a second. There's two sides to one coin here. On one side is the victim and on the other side is the creator. And if I'm the creator, if I'm the master of my reality, I chose this. I chose to be born into this family. I chose to receive those weird comments. Sometimes I chose to feel like a complete alien in amongst like, who the hell are these people? You know, whatever it might be for you, even really heavy traumas. When we flip the perspective from it's happening to me to it is happening for me, and then eventually to it is happening, wow, through me, then you start to see, you put yourself back in the driver's seat and you're like, ah, now I get it. All of this was orchestrated to lead me exactly to where I am now. And now that I understand it, now I get to choose. Now I get to be conscious. Now I get to write it in the way that I want to write it and create the story that I want to create. And even more than that, um, to um, really recognize your, our true service to the planet, which is not anything to do with the doing. You know, it's nothing to do with the roles that we play. It's it's coming back to that original state of being, whatever that is for you and how you share that through your everyday interaction. It's enough. It's more than enough. You know, it's like our true purpose is totally different to the roles that we play. So this is really what I'm passionate um, about sharing. And, and, and then just quickly, that that other flip side of that too about becoming conscious of the energy that we're taking in and giving out well how do we flip that you know like how do we flip that in a world where as you said there is so much chaos well for great change to happen there has to be chaos everything has to break down before it can break through you can see that in a petri dish you know, if you look at Bruce Lipton's work, he'll talk about how you'll have a single cell amoeba and you'll have it in the Petri dish and everything's hunky dory. It's all roses. There's no, there's no discord, disharmony, nothing. Everything's fine. But what happens eventually? It dies because there's no growth. There's no evolution. There's no change. If you put in a bacteria that opposes and they start to, you know, and everything goes like that, there's chaos. There's all this chaos and things break down, but then there's this perfect order and they divide and then they start to, they start to replicate, right? And a new, a new species is born. That's what we're doing now. We're, we're really rebirthing a whole new human, human, you know, new human. And the chaos and everything that we see around us, it's really hard to be in and it's really hard to witness and watch, but I feel like we want to honor and acknowledge the feelings that come up around it. Of course, we want to be able to do what we can do, but I think one of the most important things that we can do is to understand what is happening and to do our best to keep our eye on the prize and stay in our highest frequency of light and our highest frequency of love even if we're sharing about it even if we're out in the front line helping to do something about it you can still you know like i always go back to the great master i'm not talking from a religious perspective but the great ascended master jesus christ all the shit that he got thrown at him and what did he do he stayed in the highest frequency of love right that was his medicine you know, that was his healing. It's such a, the best possible example that we can have. I mean, he was persecuted and he stayed in the highest frequency of love. He never judged it. You know, it's a big call, but that's what we're being asked to orientate back to. And how do we do that when everything is breaking down around us? Well, the biggest generator of high frequency energy is nature. So babies, puppies you know this is why i think people love to see the you know on instagram they follow all of the cute stories of the cute animals because it's high frequency energy and people can take the piss out of it and say oh you're wasting your time on that no you're not if you're looking at that and you're like oh you know and it's bringing up feelings of compassion or gratitude or love that's heart coherence that's what we need on the planet it's not fluffy it's important so doing whatever it is that you can and you know 
as I say, if you can't be in nature, you might be in an apartment block in the middle of the city, but you can close your eyes and imagine nature. And all you've got to do is put yourself inside of a crystal and make it any color that you want. Make sure that the point goes into the earth and the point goes above and feel yourself as the crystal in this beautiful frequency and just breathe the sunlight. Imagine the sun rising in front of you or the ocean or whatever it is that brings you that harmony and breathe it, you know, and be conscious or look at the pictures of the fluffy animals and really consciously receive the energy that you feel from that because it's a frequency shift and it's um, we, just like we have to train our muscles and train everything, train our mind, we also have to train our energy. We've got to train, train our frequency into being into that higher frequency energy so that when the heavy stuff comes up, we don't judge it, we can hold it in compassion, we can take the steps necessary, we can feel the compassion without being overwhelmed by the empathy because the empathy takes us out and then we're no good to anybody. Okay, so speaking about that awareness part of the conversation, right, kind of remembering who we are as beings and having this experience, I always think like if we're these high vibrational beings, why come down to such a dense place for this experience, right? If if we're already assuming, you know, most of us, if not all of us work in the light, right? My understanding of light beings, high vibrational beings or beings that understand love, right? They hold space for all of the wonderful things that we can think about, right? That we want to experience here on this earth. So why come down to experience that, right? Because I always hear that source wants to experience itself. We're a part of source, but I'm like, these experiences are so jarring, especially when we don't remember that we signed up for this, right? So so why come down to this point? I don't know if you've ever thought about that, um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I nearly burst out laughing because you said, why do we come? And you know what they said? Why not? Why not? We come to have fun. We come to experience the joy of this amazing planet and all of the, the all of the everything is here for us. None of it belongs to us, but it's all here for us. It's all here for us to enjoy. So why wouldn't you want to come and experience that? You know, like really we can get into all of the there's so many different layers and you know there's there's the volunteers that come there's the ones that you know I, I, the old souls that have definitely been the victim the perpetrator the martyr and the healer so if you think you're all love and light let me tell you you've <laughs> definitely had lifetimes where you were not love and light but you know the thing with humans is that we have to experience well the spiritual beings inhabiting a human body is that we come here to experience and we experience contrast right we swing all the way one way to come all the way back the other way and then eventually we find our center we find our way so we've had to you know as old souls the old souls that roam the earth have been everything um, I think the path of the light worker is nothing grandiose or makes anybody special it's just that we come in at a different uh, trajectory point we come in with a different awareness because we have either we're either coming in as as volunteers we're coming in purely to experience what's going on down there on earth and have some fun and be in some service and you know give some help i mean in the andean cosmovision it's all about the reason that we're here is all about being in service so but in service doesn't mean in a laborious way um, there's a guiding principle called Yankai, and Yankai means sacred work. So it's first and foremost, we're in service here to Pachamama. I've been shown time and time again in the temples when I connect into my original and to the original elder beings, and I ask them the question like, what? why are we here like why did we even come and they're like because the earth is a is a paradise planet but she also needs in her own journey she needs um uh i guess assistance and support and um how it's not through it, it manifests in the physical by tending to the earth and taking care of the earth which is what the indigenous people were so incredibly good at until things changed over time but that was a cycle within itself that the earth needed to go through but also from an energetic perspective it's knowing ourselves again as that crystal as that conduit of light that literally while we're here and experiencing we are also in service by anchoring 
the, the, the frequencies, the codes of light into the earth that she needs. We're conduits of that energy. So, you know, at the moment we have unprecedented solar flares that are happening, that are coming from the sun. Well, it's hitting the earth, but who do you think it's hitting? <laughs> you know, those solar flares are, are hitting our physical being and it's kind of like being struck by lightning and that's why people are feeling it so much in that dense physical body. But those, that photonic light has information. That photonic light has codes. So I think number one is we're here to experience and to have fun. Number two, we're here to be in joyful and effortless service through our being, um, which then translates also into our sacred work. You know, in the times of the Inca and the pre-Inca, they celebrated their, um, their masters, their awakened masters, not because they were like uh, a spiritual guru, but because they gave they're all with precision to whatever they decided to be. If they were an engineer, everything went into that, all their heart, all their love. That was their purpose, their divine service. You know, there was always this knowing, um, this remembering that they were here to be a part of something, a part of a community. It wasn't just about the I. That's where I think we got so separated as well as just thinking it's about me and my journey and forgetting to take that Condor's perspective that it's about a global journey. We're in this together. So yeah, why? Um, why not? You know? <laughs> why not yeah exactly and sometimes I, I i always make this joke i'm like oh so i guess just being high vibrational beings sitting in some sort of ethereal plane is kind of boring so maybe we need a little bit of action sometimes um so yeah. thank you for expressing that and i i kind of want to take a step back a bit and talk about you a little bit right because we've been talking about awareness and this need to know and remember who we are, right? But we also talked about societal programming and having to deconstruct a lot of things. And we know that whenever people have a spiritual awakening, they go through certain traumatic events, right? Heartbreak is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. Health scares, um, different types of experiences. And I just kind of want to talk about you a little bit, right? So you said that when you were younger, you used to be able to perceive the unseen world, especially nature spirits, right? So I want you to talk about that and then walk me through that experience up until you being um, a person who was working in the entertainment industry and the fashion industry, and that eventually leading to some health scares and some near-death experiences. Yeah. To, and then I'm assuming probably served as a catalyst to your um, yeah. spiritual journey. So I want to know all of that because you have so much wisdom and I just want to know how you got to be the person that you are today. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I My life has been very full and very colorful and it has been reinvented so many times. And, you know, sometimes I hear people coming when I'm working with them and they're like, oh, I've got this terrible family and they don't accept me for who I am. And, and I'm like, I was, by the time I was two days old, I was strapped to my mum's hip behind the public bar of a ho of the pub. My mum and dad were publicans. I don't know if you have that word in the States, but you know, hotels, bars, it was a bar with strippers, prostitutes, drunks, you know, the whole thing. And um, I really feel that my shamanic training began then because children, especially up till the age of seven are like, you know, we're talking about transformers of energy up until the age of seven, you are mega transforming energy. This is why, or, and, and even beyond, even really up to puberty, this is why you see, you know how a lot of kids get these really gnarly childhood illnesses. And then all of a sudden around 12 or 13, even things like leukemia, you know, like childhood leukemia, I had childhood asthma, and then it kind of disappears by the time you get to be a teenager, because in those first years you are processing everything that's going on around you and in um, traditional cultures even here still in the andes in the high mountains they're very aware of how those energies affect the children so they're always clearing the children you know they're helping them to move if they've taken on too much the way that a child will move that energy if they've taken on too much is through tears tantrums laughter running all the things we don't do as adults to move the energy right that kids do innately so for me it really started then 
And then as I got um, older, like I'd say around about, oh, my mum still to this day laughs because she's like, she said, I would spend eight hours sitting in a dark garage, in a like where the car was meant to be, but it had things stored in there, talking to the dwarves. And I'd come in and she'd be like, what have you been doing in there? And I'd be like, I've been speaking to the dwarves. So it'd be like all day of that. And then by the time I was five or six, I started perceiving spirits big time. And they weren't always, well, I guess maybe even if they were friendly to a five or a six year old who has no training or <laughs> anyone to support her in the process, it was terrifying, you know. So I learned to um, do rituals. I taught myself to do these certain rituals. And, you know, I was laughing with someone just earlier because if, if my mum and dad had have um, taken me, dragged me off to see a child psychologist, I probably would have been labelled with something and put on some sort of medication, to be honest. Um, but I knew exactly what I was doing. And I knew how if I did some things in a certain way, it would close that doorway and then the per I wouldn't see the people at night. And so I started to figure all this stuff out. Um, super fascinated with the, with, um, all things of the unseen right through being a teenager dabbled in some things when i was a teenager and had some pretty scary experiences like i'm sure with the ouija boards and all of that oh, i don't even want to talk about it's horrible um all that freaky stuff and then when by the time i was 18 i started um being really interested in astral travel but at the same time this was back in the day um where the party scene was really big and i got right into it I loved, I mean, like, I had a very good time. And when I look back on it now, I realise that those altered states that I loved to be in, um, I would, on the outside, my physical body looked like it was dancing on a dance floor, but on the inside, I was meeting with beings from different dimensions and having conversations with them. <laughs> so, you know, but this was all happening quite unconsciously because I had no um support or training normal like how would my mum and dad know how to do that that wasn't in their realities it's not their fault it's just that you know um interestingly i found out later not far off my dad passing when he was still able to move about and he came to visit me in byron bay where i live when i'm in australia or and my mum is there too now since he passed and I took him up to this place called the Crystal Castle and he just made a beeline for this incredible amethyst cave and he was like a kid in a candy store. He wouldn't let it go and I was so not my dad. Like my dad was a public and big, you know, charismatic sort of, you know, big ego, fun and all of this and then here he is with this crystal cave and I'm like to my mum, what is going on with him with this? And she said, well, you know, love, um, your dad used to be a stockman on the big cattle ranches up in the northwest Western Australia. These ranches are like hundreds and thousands of hectares. And I knew that, but I thought that he was rounding up the cattle on his horse. But his job and what he was employed to do was to be a dowser. He used to go out as a geomancer with sticks and find where the water was. So I had no idea and, and I started to understand a lot about my dad and some of the things that I found difficult, you know, to relate to in his behavior, you know, and uh, in terms of um, his sensitivity, then I understood why he drank a lot. I understood why he needed a lot of quiet time, even though he had this big personality. And I, it was very confusing for me. And I, and I made it about me as kids do. We always think it's about us. It wasn't about me, it was about him and what he was going through. And the life that he grew up with, you know, gave him no support for that. I mean, his father was put into a prisoner of war camp in 1945 and left there for the entire, uh, 1939, left there for the entire duration of the war. His mum died when that happened. He was basically grew up an orphan, you know, all of these things. And this poor little sensitive kid never had any kind of support network for this sensitivity. So I really got it. I'm like, wow, you know, the forgiveness and the compassion that comes when you realize these things. And so um, when I was 25, I found, oh, what, what actually happened was I had, when I was 22, um, I had a cancer scare 
uh, I had had a pap smear that was abnormal and then I was living in the UK. I went for another one and it came back normal and even though I was bleeding and they said, you don't need to have another one until you're 25. And then I came back to Australia and I was like, what? There wasn't any pain, but something just felt off in my body. I was like, something doesn't feel right. So I went back and I had a pap smear and she was like, my God, if you had have waited till you're 25, you would be dead. You're like at sin, sin three, verging on sin four, like the, you're, you're on the edge of cancer. So I had to go and have the, you know, the whole cone biopsy was not a nice experience. But anyway, that pivotal shift made me really look at everything. Um, I'd been a very, very unhealthy teenager, probably the unhealthiest I could ever know. My mum could not get me to eat anything decent. And uh, she would give up and just give me what I wanted because I was always very lean. So um, <laughs> she's like, oh my God, I got to feed this kid something. So I had this, um, yeah, this unhealthy lifestyle that I overnight was like, wow, I need to change this. And it can't just be a, a temporary thing. It has to become a lifestyle. I knew that. Like I can't, I need to really, fo and so I was the, the that annoying person that reads every single label and, you know, did tons of detoxes. And But the thing is, is I did that intensely for a couple of years and then I knew, then I knew just at a glance what was good and what, you know, what was going to serve me, what wasn't, you know, it was became a way of life. And at that same time, um, around 25, I found my way to uh, transcendental meditation or Vedic meditation, which is a very simple technique of using a mantra, you know, beautiful, beautiful ancient technique. And what was amazing about that for me is that when I was a kid, I used to lie there for hours listening to the sound of silence and I thought everyone could hear it. And it was so fascinating to me that when things were silent, there was a sound. And so when I started with this technique uh, and you drop the mantra, you hear the vibration of, of sound, of silence. I was like, oh my God, there it is, that's it. So that, um, and, and within a few months of doing that meditation, it was like everything opened, the veils dropped. And even though they'll tell you, and my meditation teacher back then kept saying to me, this is not the purpose of that meditation. I was like, well, it might not be the purpose, but this is happening. And all of a sudden I could see the chakras. I could feel it. I could see the colors. Things were spinning. I, um, oh my God, the energy that was moving through the body was incredible. Um, I was sleeping like three or four hours a night, but I had ridiculous amounts of energy. Um, and psychically stuff started to really kick in. So I started, and it was, it was actually kind of scary, to be honest. Um, you know, I've never labeled it as a spiritual awakening, but when I, and later on down the track, I was like, oh yeah, it's probably a spiritual awakening. But you know, it's like all of a sudden I am seeing spirits, I'm hearing them, they've got their knees on my chest, they're to, while I'm asleep, I'm waking up paralyzed and pinned to the bed, I'm hearing things, I'm, you know, and there was a lot of like, because when you open like that, again, without any training, you just open to everything. There was no discernment, there was just like, <sighs> and so it was from that point that I started to learn how to call in my guardians, how to work with beings, how to work with, you know, I even, a simple thing that I did is I drew very, you know, it didn't look, you know, it was just a symbol of um, protection actually. And I put it under my mattress face side up and I knew that that was creating, it was an amulet that was creating an energy that would, would allow me to sleep, like I could be in a protective. So, you know, I started to develop and figure out these tools. At that point, I started to hear um, what I knew later to be the, the wings of a hummingbird or the beat of a medicine drum. And I could hear it like, boom, 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 boom. And you go to the doctor, can you check my ears? And he's like, there's nothing wrong with your ears <laughs> when you're getting these sounds. Um, and I also started to see back then as woo-woo as it might sound, these little blue pyramids like my ring um, that were glowing neon blue like this colour. And I figured out later that they were emissaries from the Pleiades and they would always turn up when I needed assistance or support. Um, so that was 
really and that that was a very interesting time because I was very much in the public eye I was in the media I was working in TV I'm going to a-list red carpet events while all of this is going kaboom in the background I had to leave the relationship I was in because I couldn't be in a relationship I literally had to just be with this process that was going on and it went solid for a year and a half like that while I figured out how to uh, work with it and integrate it and from that actually because I am quite a strong character like I'm sort of a, I feel like I'm a bit of a natural leader um, it comes naturally to me so it didn't worry me that I was the only one that was going through this but for some people it's massive and they feel very overwhelmed and feel very unsupported for me I was good to sort of like take the reins and go okay I'm going to be the you know I'm happy to I don't care what you, that you, I lost friends. This is going to happen when you go through this. Like I lost friends because I thought I was weird and woo woo, you know, and they didn't want a part of it. Like, oh, who do you think you are? And I'm like, I don't know, but this is happening and I'm not going to change what I'm feeling and what I'm doing for anyone else. And of course, new people come in that support that, right? But what I did back then was I realized, oh, there's people out there that are feeling very unsupported. And that's actually when my first uh, groups started. And it just came from, they were free. I never used to charge anything. Once a fortnight, I would open my my apartment. I had an apartment up and I would have different people. I had a Tibetan, a beautiful Tibetan monk that would come. No one could understand a word he said, but I said, you know, I used to say to the people, don't try and understand through your mind. Just listen to the words and receive it through your heart. And so I started to create these little women, or not just women, but for everybody, these groups where people could come and join like that. And then during that process, um, I had uh, started a cosmetics company um, because I'd been actually Max Factor wanted to make a lip gloss with my name on it um, because I had this presence in TV and uh, it would have been a very sweet deal in hindsight if I had have said yes, but, um, being so um, thing with my uh, with my values and they tested on animals uh, it had parabens and all of the stuff in it it wasn't made in Australia and I wanted to do something that was natural and beautiful started my own brand was very very successful I had a lot of support but I did it with no money I had a couple of um, properties that I'd bought when I was really young and I borrowed money against that and I started the whole thing and it went kaboom. I had no idea what I was doing. I was green around the gills. I ended up attracting some investors that kind of long story short, at the end of it all left me with a million and a half dollars worth of debt and ran, did a runner on me. And I've got no way of paying this. So I ended up 10 years of struggle to try and keep this thing afloat. Loved it though, because even back then, the slogan for the brand, believe it or not, was Awaken the Goddess. And all of the products products were named after the chakras, the angels. So this was my way of bringing um, my spirituality and my awareness into the mainstream. And every single box had, you know, it cost me a fortune to do this and everyone told me I was mad, but every single product had a different inspirational quote so that when women opened it, they would always see this affirmation. So this is way back, you know, right back even when I was in my late 20s, this was naturally coming through and I worked hard. I had no one working for me. My mum and I would label boxes at 4 a.m. in the morning and all of the things. So I really, really tried. And then I got to the point when these guys did the runner on me and I was like, you know what? I'm now, I knew enough by then that um, you take the cues from the universe. There are always going to be obstacles, but when there's consistent mountains for you to climb then you are being told that there is a completion to this and that there is something else there for you and that's where it breaks the ego down you know because that the fall of that was on the front page of all the national newspapers at the same time i was dating a very well-known actor uh, in australia and i broke up with him at the same time and my dad was diagnosed with a terminal illness so this all came at once um and the headlines on the paper, because my last name is Gaunt, was she's gone, like it was a play on my name. Um, and it was such an incredible experience. It's not to say that it wasn't challenging and difficult, but, you know, I remember times so clearly, this time I remember so clearly 
I was going to a meditation retreat for the weekend and the shit was hitting the fan. I mean, I had, I had people coming at me, abusing, you know, really, really intense stuff. And I had this sense of being um, totally like a, disconnected from it all in a way that I was able to see the whole situation and I could see all the drama, but I wasn't identified with drama. And I was just like doing what I needed to do, you know, calmly. And I, and, and I was filled with this high frequency energy. You know, there were times where I wasn't like that. There were times that I was just like, you know, oh, you know, and under it all. But I, for some reason, I had this knowing that the, the the challenge was getting me somewhere that it was helping me to refine um, and i had 17 years in total of of constant severe financial stress and then i had my second business was birthed very soon after that which wasn't meant to be a business i didn't want it to be a business i really really fought for it not to be it was a passion it was with raw food and then i had a visitation from this giant <laughs> It's crazy, but from this giant, like 20 foot glowing blue being that handed me a crystal and said, get out of the, get out of the way. This has got nothing to do with you. We're going to download you with stuff that you know nothing about. And you just have to do it because this is in 2007, because there's something coming on the planet and there's going to be a lot of high frequency energy hitting the planet. And most people on the planet won't be able to assimilate or integrate it. It's going to fry their circuits and they'll probably die. <laughs> the directive so it's not about you this is about a living a, a loving vibration through living food and you need to get it out into the mainstream as much as you can so that it's not just preaching to the converted make it delicious make it sexy we'll give you the recipes and that's it and so then i started getting downloaded with all these crazy beautiful recipes for these amazing raw food creations so i'm just listening and making and then one person speaks to another and the next thing I'm getting phone calls, can we have those things in our shop? Oh my God, I'm like, no, but I did. And then within six months, it was in 200 stores across and I'm in the kitchen doing it myself because I had no money. I borrowed $600 off my mum and I bought seeds to make the things, which I think is such a metaphor when I look back on it now. And I used to spend all night in the kitchen and then the way that that eventually grew was this beautiful woman who who stayed with me right till the end of that business uh she came in one night um because i couldn't afford a kitchen uh, a commercial kitchen and these the places i was selling to said sorry but if you're making them out of your house we can't buy them because it's not legal you need a commercial kitchen but i didn't have the money so what i did was i did an exchange i found a store that wanted the product um and we swapped stock for use of their kitchen but i couldn't get in there until their chef finished at night so it meant that i couldn't start till five or six o'clock so i was going all through the night till six o'clock the next morning this beautiful woman sees me and she's like wow you're doing such an amazing job this is so beautiful um why haven't you got anyone helping you and i was like because i haven't got any money and she's like oh my god she's like okay karma yoga i'm gonna give you three hours twice a week after my shift for free I just want to be a part of this. I just want to help you. And that kindness from her heart that she did, that beautiful Aini, within a few weeks, um, I was able to pay her. And then all of a sudden, Naked Treaties was born. But I still didn't quite learn my lesson. And I got it to a point where it was beautiful and doing super well. And then um, two things happened. One, my shamanic path really kicked in and appeared and two it was getting too much for me to handle on my own so i brought in some people and um there was lessons there that i hadn't learned about that and things got a bit hard on the financial perspective so it was always a challenge to keep that door open and to keep all the employees and stuff it took a lot of energy but we did it um and i loved it and i just loved um, the way that people received through that still now people remember it it was just phenomenal and anyways coming up to where i am now in um, 2012 uh, is when i really stepped onto the shamanic path i experienced a really really what i would call traumatic ayahuasca ceremony nothing to do with the beautiful medicine but the facilitation wasn't awesome um, 
which really taught me about what kind of facilitator I wanted to be. So there were many gifts that came from that ceremony, but it left me in a state of pretty much psychosis for about six months, severe personalization where I couldn't get back into my body. And uh, the way that I ended up healing was I found a tiny little elder uh, that I was doing some, um, we, he was training me with some energy transmissions from a place called Keros, which is, as I was saying, about six and a half thousand meters up in the mountains. And uh, in 20 minutes, in a very humble, simple, beautiful ceremony, he called me back. He, uh, that was my first experience of a soul retrieval. And I was just like <clears throat> straight back in my body. And from that moment on, I was like, this is my path. And so I ended up, um, uh, not long after that, I met my maestro Puma and he threw the coca leaves for me. And he's like, oh, hang on, check again. Throws him, he's like, wow, don't often see this. He said, my love, don't let that blonde hair and blue eyes fool you. He said, these are your mountains. I was in Peru. He said, and you're a medicine woman and you need to come back here ASAP and train. And so that's what I did. So I was adopted into that lineage, trained as a watchmaker, as, as serving the ancestral medicines. And uh, now I teach alongside him. We have like a year long program where we teach women uh, amongst other things. And then fast forward, uh, going through many, many, many initiations. I mean, that would make your toes curl and it was not an easy time, but I ended up giving my business away. In 2017, I handed it over to some people that I, that I felt would take care of it. And I walked away with nothing. And um, I was correct. I had, that's a whole other story. I can tell you so many stories. I, again, I had another being appear to me and, and basically challenge me and say, are you ready? Because if you are, you got to be courageous and you got to let it go. And I did that and a relationship. And um, that was it. From that moment onwards, I often use the metaphor that it was like being on a freeway with the handbrake on. And at that point, the handbrake dropped and everything just opened up for me. And that's where I am now. So I've been, yeah, doing always, even while I was in that challenging process at the end of my last business, you know, I started serving medicine in 2013 and working with people shamanically in deep transformational spaces. So I was doing both. I really kind of burned myself out because I was, you know, I'd bring people to Peru from 2013 and I would uh, be with them until 11 or 12 o'clock at night and then I'd get on the email and start with my business. So it was very full on for many years. From about 2013 to 2017, it was like crazy pants. But again, it was all, you know, I feel like we're born ready, but one step is always preparing us for the next. So it was all preparation, preparation. And, you know, we evolve and it changes. And now the work has become really, really beautiful, strong, powerful, effortless, joyful, and helping a lot of people. And I love it. <laughs> what an incredible story. I mean, there's, there's so many paths we could go from everything that you shared, right? First of all, I think being so psychically gifted at such a young age, right? And being able to perceive and being just such an open I don't know if it's an open channel or just your senses are pretty heightened, right? Like we all have psychic abilities, but I think some people are more tapped in than others. And it seems like from a very young age, you were very tapped in, right? So to seeing or interacting with entities that may or may not have been low vibrational, but they weren't necessarily positive experiences. And then like all of the experiences you've had through your, your life thus far. So Okay, so my first question is, as a medicine woman, does that mean you're also a shaman? And do you feel like your experiences kind of equipped you with the work you needed to do as a shaman between being the bridge of the spirit world with the, the earthly realm, especially as it pertains to the people that you work with? That word shaman is thrown around so much. I'm always, I, I use it in its context, but I'm also aware and wary of it because it's, it can mean so many different things to so many people. I mean, the, the word originated in Mongolia, you know, and really for me, what a shaman is, is exactly as you said, it's somebody who walks between the worlds. So, you know, what does that mean? It means that you your communion with the beings of the seen and the unseen world, particularly the nature spirits. I mean, for me, I love to talk to mountains. I love mountains. 
They tell me everything I need to know. They give me wisdom, guidance, advice. They're my security guards. They stand on the portals of the four directions in my ceremonies. They manage the energy. They go to people and give me accounts of what that person is going through. They come back and tell me I can tell them what to do. They go back and they do it. You know, this is shamanism. It's like being so acutely aware to the signs, the synchronicities, the omens that you don't just see the physical world for what it is. You understand that there are messages in everything and everything is speaking to you. Everything is guiding you and that is how you're the conduit because when you're working with the person, you know, for me and even mm -hmm. listening to the medicine, you know, as a medicine woman and I'm serving medicine, um, how do I know what somebody needs in a moment, right? It's a combination of obviously my intuitive feeling, but it's also um, the medicine is telling me, their higher self is speaking to me. My apples, my mountain spirits and the elements are talking to me. I'm reading the way the air's moving. If it's raining at certain times and how heavy it's raining, it's telling me something about the ceremony. This is shamanism. You're reading everything that's going on. And that, that, that reading comes from being in deep communion with it. So to be a, a shaman, um, is a way of life. It's not something you pick up and put down in ceremony. It's something that you cultivate in every single moment of every single day. You know, my altar is behind me. It goes with me everywhere I go. I'm always connecting. Even if it's not with me, I can pick up rocks and program it to be that. So, you know, it's uh, that really, I think, is the essence of what shamanism is. And, and from that, um, there are different ways of working with that energy. So like here in the Andes, there's different levels. Uh, there's the Paco, the Pampa Masayok, we call it, which works with ritual, right? So you're moving the energy by working physically with something, by working with offerings, by working with rituals, by working with ceremonies. And then the next level, which not everybody, and it's not a hierarchy, it's just a different way of perceiving um, or a different way of interacting or communing. But the kind of the next level is what's called an altar masayok. And an altar masayok doesn't need rituals or ceremonies. They transcend that. And they're just moving the energy directly, either with their thought, with their hand, with their with their breath by speaking to the mountains and getting the mountains to work on behalf of them. So that is the, the path of the altar masayok. Uh, so there's different kinds of different levels, I guess, or kinds of shamanism within and each culture is going to have that same similar kind of thing, but in a different way. Um, you know, working with whether you're working with earth spirits, whether you're working with the angelic realms. For me, I work with it all, but I have a very, very strong program. And that program is non-negotiable. And that is that I only work with the absolute highest frequencies of light and love. I only work with my highest frequency or higher. When I'm working with my altar, I tap into all of the altars around the world, but I only accept uh, working with the altars of the highest frequencies of light and love. If there is somebody, or a, whether it's a spirit or um, a physical being like a person that is ready to be healed, that needs liberation and that's ready to transform, then they are welcome in my ceremony. But if it is a malevolent energy or a spirit that is not ready because every spirit has free will, I'm sorry, but this is not your space. You can come back when you're ready, but otherwise my ceremony is off limits for you and they are just not allowed in the door. So that's the way that I work. I don't, I don't call on those heavy energies to move energy. Some people do. Some people call on the light and the dark. I don't. I only work with, with the highest frequencies of light. I'm in service to those energies, as I say, that are ready and willing to be liberated. But if they're not ready, that's their free will. Then they stay over there. When they're ready, they can come. Ultimately, at the end of the day, everything is in service to the light. Even the heavy energies. When I say heavy energies, I'm talking about spirits, emotions, vibrations, people, I'm just, you know, in the Andean Cosmovision, we keep it very cut and dry. There's no judgment. There's nothing right or wrong. It's complementary. And we have hucha, which is heavy, and sami, which is light. So there's a dense frequency and there's a high frequency. That's it, right? So when you depersonalize it like that and stop labeling things as right, wrong, good or bad, and you just choose the frequency that you want to work with, like you can box in the shadows or dance in the light. I prefer to dance. You know, that's this is the they call it tinkwi in in the Andean Cosmovision. Tinkwi is the word for battle, but it also means dance. So we don't have to go in fighting. We can move with the energy and dance with the energy, right?
to me that shamanism so i'm uh yeah i mean i don't it's funny because when people say to me what do you do i'm like whoa you know what do you, <laughs> I don't know what to say because if i say i'm a shaman then they're like they're either like that or they're like wow and it just it's got a connotation that word um i'm a watcher meta like that's a traditional thing i've been trained to surf watcher so i'm i'm a watcher meta or a kurendera um i'm yeah i work as a shaman i work as these things i'm not these things but i work as these things but ultimately what i do is i love to create um, powerful transformational spaces for people where I hold them and the space in their highest light so that they can resolve whatever it is that is holding them back and help them to step into their highest frequency and their highest purpose. So that's what I'm doing. I'm Luke Skywalker with my lightsaber and the force is with me. <laughs> mm, I love that analogy. Thank you for sharing that. Um, speaking of shamanism, you, you, you mentioned ayahuasca and you having a not so great experience with that when you, um, you know, had that experience. It's not against the plant medicine itself. It was more of the ceremony and the shaman who was facilitating it. Mm. But it, it it is something I want to talk about because I think it's become a buzzword now, right? Like people talk about ascension and awakening and tapping into their spirituality. But like a lot of things, when it gets into the hands of human beings, we might misconstrue things or it, we might make something a fad without really knowing exactly what we're tapping into, what we're playing with and all of that stuff and the ramifications they could have. So I just want to talk a little bit more about ayahuasca ceremonies. Do you think this is something that a lot of people should be dabbling into? Is it necessary? What are the pros and the cons? Yeah, it's a really, really good question and a very, very important one. Um, so first to say that um, because of everything that we've been through on this planet over the last 5,000 years in this cycle that we've been in, the medicines are coming forth now in purpose of healing because there's been an accumulation of heavy energy meaning a lot of trauma a lot of unprocessed a lot of unprocessed trauma a lot of ancestral wounding all of the stuff and for us to to really shift into that 5d that we've been talking about we got to clean that stuff out it's like picking up the cup the medicine cup and and tipping it upside down you know emptying it all out so that it can be refilled with with the truth you know of where we're moving to so that has largely become uh the purpose of the medicines in recent times and why they're becoming so um you know they're really out there now but that was never the original purpose of the medicines the original purpose way back in the day was to help the ancestors um to remember the um the knowledge the wisdom, the instruction, the guidance from our divine ancestry so that they could create awakened civilizations on the earth. They understood, you know, when you go into the temples and stuff here in Peru, Bolivia and Egypt and all of these places, but let's just talk about this land because this is where these medicines are really prolific. You know, there's you, you can't walk into a temple without seeing a master holding a medicine cup and its head is not on its shoulders its head is at its heart right this is beautiful people misinterpreted this and saw them as being a decapitating um dynasty they weren't at all this head that the, the head that's at the heart is like this it's got this huge big smile and these like calm like like buddha type eyes and then it's holding the medicine cup so the medicine is this decapitator like the medicine of huachuma which is a bit different to ayahuasca literally um loosely translates to decapitation so it's like taking the ego mind and holding or merging or um uh, creating that coherence with the heart so that's what the medicines are really for um but exactly as you said and so beautifully put as well without any judgment whatsoever because you know you have to be careful of that of thinking that somebody's doing it right and somebody's doing it wrong ultimately i think that um you know people are going to resonate and and um 
and find themselves um, being drawn to a facilitator that is at their frequency at the time. It might not always be the best process for the person that's coming, but it, maybe there's a learning process in, in there for them that they need to go through. You know, everything is perfect, what everybody is receiving. And then there is a lot of stuff going on out there at the moment where there's just people that have no idea what they're doing. And really, when you're opening these realms up, it's delicate. It is so delicate because you're not just working on this third dimension, you know, you're working on the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension and all of the, the, the angelic beings. But as you were saying too, you know, there's uh, all these other energies that are able to come in as well. So as a facilitator, you need to be impeccable. You need to be precise. You need to know exactly what you're opening, exactly how you're closing it. You need to know exactly who is there supporting you and how to work with them. Um, and your communion, as I said, it can't be, oh, I'm going to go and facilitate a ceremony and then I'm just going to go back to life. You know, life is the ceremony. As a, facil as a facilitator of these sacred medicines, the, the work is to continually close the gap between the formal ceremony and ceremony of life so that you're walking it, you're living it, you're walking your talk. And, um, yeah, I think that it's important for people to be very, very discerning. The medicines are so beautiful and can be so helpful. You don't need to work with them every weekend. You don't need to work with them every month. They're medicine. You know, it's there for a reason. So, yes, we might have con concentrated periods of time where people come, you know, on pilgrimage and we work with the medicine over a concentrated period, but there's also a purpose and a reason of how we're doing that. But the danger I see is where um, it becomes more about the community, which is a beautiful thing, but you know, it's like drinking ayahuasca every weekend is not serving anybody. How are you integrating that? When you're receiving from these beautiful plant spirits, you're given a diamond in the rough and your job is to polish it. You got to, see what it is that you've been given, integrate it and then walk it in the world. Otherwise, it's no good. You can't go into sitting in an ayahuasca ceremony and think that it's she's just going to come in and take all of your all of your problems away. Or if she's showing you, um, you know, through the visions and through the thing, which it's definitely not an addictive plant at all. There's nothing but people get addicted to the experience, to the community, to coming and seeing the same people sitting in the circle. There's a danger in that too for me because what are you really changing? You know, I've seen, I've had a lot of people come and work with me that have been very enmeshed in these communities and the energy's sticky, you know, like it's really, it's entangled because it becomes, we have to be careful as spiritual communities and conscious communities. It's another form of, colonization i'm so sorry to say it but i see it like in bali i see it here uh in the sacred valley in pisak in peru not to say there's anything against it because there's some beautiful things going on there too but it's just like we just swoop on in with all of our spiritual ideas there's people in the sacred valley in pisak that don't even know what a mesa is they don't even know what the medicine bundle is yet they're serving medicine it's like how does that even how does that work you know like for me, I don't know, I'm a bit of a traditionalist like that. I mean, I'm a blonde lady with blue eyes, so I'm, I'm not Andean, but um, I, I, my maestro Puma says to me that I live it more than any Andean that he knows, you know, because I, I really, um, I have so much reverence for these traditions and for the medicines. And the re things are done in a certain way and in a certain order, not because it's dogmatic, it's for safety, it's because it works, you know, so you if you if my advice is is that if somebody is feeling called it's not after one ceremony we get it all the time people come into one ceremony oh the medicine spoke to me and told me i'm meant to serve it and then all of a sudden they've found a way to get it and they're taking it into their communities that's ego if you're really meant to serve it and you get that message then it happened to me and i just handed it right over and i and i was thankfully aware enough to know that the ego was at play and I was like okay well if this is really what's meant then I'm just going to hand it over and it's going to come and it did you know it showed, and it was you know it was a it was a process that I had to follow and I had to really um give up a lot in my life to really walk that path so that's my feeling on it I, I feel that they are so powerful so beautiful also you know my feeling is that this all the way of smashing yourself open to heal and grow is so old paradigm we don't need to do it like that anymore do it through sweetness 
do it through gentleness. The medicines can be easy. They should be easy. They're, they're kind, you know, even if you're going through a challenging process where you're seeing something that, oof, you know, that's big, I want to let that go. If the container is um, set up beautifully, then you feel yourself so held and you feel yourself in that light and you're like, yeah, I can do this. It's easy. It's sweet. It's effortless. So, you know, if people come to drink ayahuasca or wachuma um, with me, the first thing we'll say is, are you feeling fear? And if it's yes, microdose. We don't need to smash you open. Let's give you, you know, there's, there's so much to be received in the subtlety. You can receive just as deeply as being shot out into the cosmos. So better you have a microdose and get, you, you know, uh, it's because it's a relationship with the medicine because the medicine is a spirit. So better to build the relationship with the medicine you know, introduce yourself, feel comfortable, and then, mm, okay, yep, I'm feeling good. I can have a little bit more, you know, and work like this. Or even, we even give hummingbird doses, which is like a drop. Sometimes, often we have elders coming to sit in the ceremony. It's too much for them, you know, hummingbird dose, just enough, like a little sip, just enough to connect to the spirit of the medicine. Ultimately, we don't even need to drink the medicine to connect to the spirit of that. And that's something that I teach in my Maestro Puma and I with our group. But yeah, that's one of the things that, that we teach is how to program um, water with the essence of the medicines and do that like a dieta. You know, you do that every day and people have such deep insights. Um, and that's also why um, I have for years uh, shared an apprenticeship in serving the medicine of cacao because cacao is a very powerful medicine and she's safe and when you learn how to work with it in a very direct in this shamanic way like the way that I teach has the fundamentals of how I work in ceremony with the ancestral medicines so that is a medicine that people can be like I feel the call to be in service normal we're in this period in time where it's like we want to be of help right that's where it comes from it's not coming from uh, an egoic desire it's coming from a genuine desire to want to help right I see that in people but it takes a long time to apprentice in those medicines. So how can we still be working in those powerful ways and creating those spaces with the medicine? Work with cacao. You can program the cacao with the stronger medicines with Wachuma and ayahuasca. You can program it, you know, and you can have these beautiful circles that are safe, sealed up, integrated, and people have amazing um, breakthroughs. So yeah. And it's a beautiful medicine for this time, cacao, because she, Ish Cacao, she opens the heart. You know, mm. it's, it's all about receiving the sweetness, receiving the profound sweetness and joy and clarity about where we're going, what we're doing. Yeah. I love how that you, you talked about the ego part of it too. I think, I mean, as human beings, we have our ego and sometimes it does serve a purpose because it keeps us moving forward in our goals and tasks that we need to complete. But other times um, it's very self-serving in a way that could be potentially detrimental to our self-evolution. And I think we're at a time now where we're talking about elevating our frequencies and becoming more spiritual. And again, because we are human beings, it's kind of like in our nature to kind of get to the top, right? Like how spiritual can I be? How awakened can I be? And, you know, we might chase certain modalities that we're not ready for, or we might not even need, right? Everyone has a different process. And the more you continue to open and you're not necessarily always going to break open, right? You might have moments that break you open and you have other moments that you don't need to be broken open for, right? Um, so I think, and even thinking about like, ancestral lineage and I've, I've started to hear this often and I want to have someone on the show to talk about it is that we all kind of have like specific spiritual blueprints that align better with us based on our ancestors and and what they did and you know for some people just high level um thoughts here like maybe someone is drawn to shamanism because they've had like an essential lineage with shamans in their family and other people might be drawn to other types of practices that are more aligned with them. So I just I, I just like how you called out the ego part there because I do think that people are not aware of it. And while these medicines are important and they do help people kind of understand why they're so depressed and why they're so down, at the same time, 
um, it's just something people need to be very careful of because if you go to the wrong practitioner, it could have um, some, con it, it could it could leave lasting effects, right? So, cause you're opening yourself up in your channel. So thank you for sharing that. And I just kind of want to ask this one last question. We've been talking about awakening and, and higher frequencies and, and growth and all of that. How can we stay grounded in the light, right? Because I know some people talk about, oh, you need to protect yourself while you're on this journey. Other people say, well, you don't need to worry about protection because the higher you are going up in frequency, anything low frequency can't get to you, right? So there's so many rules of thought. And I just want to he hear from you. How can we anchor in the light as we go through our journey to remembering? Absolutely. It's such an important one. And it's, it's quite simple, really. Um, yes, you know, as we move into the higher frequency, the lower frequencies can't exist. But you have to anchor those frequencies in. Because, you know, sometimes you, you hear that and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm hearing that, but I'm feeling the low frequency here. Like, I'm, <laughs> this is, <laughs> where's the high frequency gone? I'm feeling, this is terrible. So we have to, again, you know, it's training. It's training ourselves in the way that, as I said before, in the way that we train our muscles. And I think the simplest thing, I'll give you a, a quick tool that we can use now, but what I would love to do is uh because we've been this has been coming up a lot in our conversation is i have a, a month-long uh self-paced um training it's a shamanic training called be the crystal and it's a training in energetic resilience so it's activity into a superpower and i'd love to gift that um to your listeners you me um for free um, I'll give you a code. It's normally 333 US, I think, but um, I'd love to give that to you. Why? Because it helps. And a lot of people that have done this are like, wow, this has really changed things for me. And that's that's the whole name of the game, isn't it? When we're just, you know, trying to give people the tools that they need. And, you know, a simple, simple way um, is simply, let's just do it together to close, shall we? Quick process? Yes, of course. Okay. So just close your eyes for a moment. Take your right hand, place it onto your heart and take your left hand and place it onto your belly or to your womb or to your solar plexus, wherever it feels good. Feel where your hand is touching your body and just simply to begin, just take a deep breath in and out just to regulate your nervous system and bring you into this present moment. Now imagining uh, a beautiful silver thread at your heart and see that silver thread going down through your solar plexus, through your womb or your belly, through your root, down through your legs like the roots of trees and deep down into the core of Pachamama, into the earth. Sensing your legs like the roots of the trees, feeling yourself deeply, deeply connected, remembering that you weren't placed on to Pachamama, you were a seed that grew from within her. So you are naturally deeply grounded. You are naturally deeply earthed and connected to this earth. Now just imagine that you're receiving all of the grounding, all of the healing and everything that you need and breathe that silver thread up into your heart and breathe in everything that you need to feel totally centered and grounded. And on your out breath, send it back down into the earth. On your in breath, breathe it into your heart again. And now imagine a golden thread and on your out breath, send the golden thread up past your throat, your third eye, out through your crown, through the sky above you and find your star. In the center of the cosmos, your divine origin, where you came from. Feel this golden thread as it anchors into this place of light. Maybe here you might meet some ascended masters, some elders, grandmothers, grandfathers. These are your ancestors. saying thank you, breathe the golden light in, breathe it down through the crown of your head, past your throat, third eye and into your heart. As you breathe out, send it back up again, connect it back into your star. 
breathe in again and breathe those codes and frequencies down, all of that remembering of who you really are. And as it reaches your heart this time, merge the gold and the silver thread together. See them twist and twirl and become like the helix of the DNA. This is the merging of the divine masculine, sacred feminine, the cosmic mother, cosmic father, and it becomes your higher self. The truth of who you are. You might even be able to feel that every single cell in your being is encoded with this gold and silver and becomes stronger and more resilient as this light begins to emanate throughout your entire body. Every breath in, you receive from above and below. Every breath out, you expand the light outwards and see how it touches and transforms everything around you. Breathe in, receive. Breathe out and give. Feeling yourself anchored and grounded to the earth and completely connected to the heavens and to the original memory. And now to finish off, imagining a beautiful neon blue crystal, a giant crystal that's double terminated, meaning that the point goes into the earth and up into the cosmos. Seeing and feeling it at least three feet around you, neon blue, and it's not only surrounding you, you are it. Feeling the crystalline nature of your being. Feeling how any energy that touches the surface of that crystal within a millisecond is instantly transformed into the highest frequencies of love, the highest frequencies of light and emanates out of blessings. So take a breath in, breathe it in, breathe it right into your center. Feel any energy, any heaviness, any feelings of being on ground completely transform. And as you breathe out, send it out. Two more times, breathe in. Send it out. Breathe in. Send it out. Just pressing your hands onto your body where they are so that you feel yourself staying aware of this field that's up, staying aware of your crystal, staying aware of being anchored to the earth and anchored to the cosmos, anchored in your light. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. Thank you, Gemma. That was beautiful. That was a great way to close out the show. Um, before I let you go, also before that, thank you for the um, gift to the audience. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Um, before I let you go, I just want to know if you've shifted in perspective on anything recently. It could be lighthearted or as deep as you want it to be. Mm, this is such a beautiful question. Yes. I don't know if I would call it a shift in perspective, but I think it's an embodiment. I think that is a shift in perspective when we know something intellectually and then all of a sudden it becomes like the aha where it's in your body. And that is how when we release our attachment to things, they come in even more magically than we could ever imagine. It's only uh, our or my I'll speak from the my it's only when I attach to something that I am separate from it as soon as I am willing to completely surrender that and let it go it's like the universe goes pow and it's like wow the magic is beyond what I ever could have imagined so that's something that has become and that manifested in my wedding on mm. the base of a mountain a couple of weeks ago a week ago week and a half ago Wow. It was just profound. So, yeah. No truer words. And congrats on being um, on your wedding, on your ceremony. That's amazing. Um, where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work or connect with you? Yeah. So, you can find me on Instagram at Anchoring the Light. Uh, same on YouTube, Anchoring the Light. Same on the website, anchoringthelight.com. Uh, with the free course Be the Crystal it's called which is the uh, resilience training for us empaths shamanic training um, if you dm resilience to us at instagram then we will send you a link to that 
I've got some amazing things coming up. There's a three month apprenticeship into serving the medicine of cacao, but it's much, much, much more than that. It's right into the Andean altar. We have masters from the Andes. We have masters from all around the world sharing amazing modalities. There's even a, a whole modality that you get for free on breath work, uh, on somatic movement and dance and on medicine songs and shamanic journeying. So it's really rich. Um, and then in January, we'll be starting again our Humpy Knusta program, which is a 12 month apprenticeship for medicine women. Uh, so everything, you know, you can do one or the other, but they all kind of lock in together. And there's more, there's plenty of free stuff as well on the website. And uh, yeah, I'd just be glad to, to assist you in any way that I can. So thank you so much.